going to look at how to find some major star patterns in the night sky. The pages that I've included in this presentation come from this book called Sticky Night Skies, and I've just scanned in part one. I encourage you to get this book if you're interested in navigating more around the night sky for parts two and three. The slides are scanned pages, which is why they'll say, you know, on the next page before you flip to the next page, or maybe the scan's a little offset from the first slide to the next slide. So this is Orion. You're very familiar with that star pattern. Orion's belt, one of those easily identifiable features. Your eye naturally goes to it with it being somewhat of a straight line. Here's the body, as many people perceive. The shield, in some cultures it's an animal hide draped over the arm as he's fighting Taurus the bull. The club, some cultures it's a sword. The star in this area up here, pretty bright, easily found in the night sky, is called Betelgeuse. And it looks a little bit redder than the uh, neighboring stars. The Betelgeuse star makes almost a right angle to the Orion's belt, making it easy to find. Betelgeuse could end its life in a supernova, which is uh, one of the stages of the life cycle of a star, which is something you'll move on to in a couple more lessons. And cosmology is a specific field of astronomy that will have some units on cosmology itself. One of the things I love about cosmology is by near future, this could mean in the next 10,000 years or so. You have to love plus or minus 10,000 years. So here's one rendering of Orion. Constellations, or of course it should say star patterns, change their orientation during the night, even though Orion larger area around would be the constellation, so perhaps it is correct. All right, find Orion's belt. Yep, the good old astronomy answer is right there, indeed. Find the belt again, right there. Now the shield. Right there. Beetlejuice. Voila. Right there. Now, using asterisms are a nice shortcut way, shorthand way of finding your way around the night sky. A little bit bigger patch of sky here. See if you can find Orion. Right there. A bigger piece of the sky to see the entire body now, not just the belt. Here's Taurus the bull. If you recall, these are Pleiades, the star cluster. Cluster of stars. Yep, right here is the body. And the belt. Usually how you find Orion is the belt. A bigger patch of sky. Try and find Orion. Right there. Different section of the, and much broader section of the night sky. Gives him time to scan for Orion. Let your eyes try and fall upon that somewhat straight line. Yep, right there. Right there, up, down, left, or right. Over here to the right, just off the edge of the page. Orion's belt there. Beetlejuice. Oh, there's the belt, so there's Beetlejuice right there. In cities, we've discussed this, how fewer stars are visible due to the glare from the light pollution, lights on the ground. Orion is here. Now the countryside, far less light pollution. Try and find Orion. Over here. This is more as the ancients would have seen things, as they obviously had fewer street lights. Take your time, find Orion.
perhaps your eye is gravitating to here. We have the Pleiades, the V-shaped horse, the bull that Orion is always fighting. So right there is Orion. Find Beetlejuice. If Orion was down there, Beetlejuice right there. And find Beetlejuice again, different patch of sky here. Orion, so Beetlejuice is there. You just correctly identified a single star from over 300. You should air high five someone that might be with you or self high five. Congratulations. All right, another star pattern, one you're very familiar with, the Big Dipper in Hinduism, the world's oldest practicing religion. These seven stars represent seven ancient sages. Here's the cup shape for dipping in many Western perceptions. The handle. Anyone seeing the teapot? Here's my handle. I certainly won't. I'll spare you. All right, Big Dipper in this big patch of sky. Big Dipper right down here. A little bit cut off there. All right, find the Big Dipper here. Remember that your sky rotates during the night or you on the earth rotate underneath the sky at night. Big Dipper, yep, right there, right there, up, down, left, or right, up to the right. Over here's the Big Dipper. Big Dipper is a very interesting feature you're about to find out. It's important you can find it. If you're unsure, you may want to go back over the last few pages. If you're ever lost in the woods, just look for the North Star. It's twinkling will comfort you as you die. All right, so we are probably familiar that the Big Dipper can help you find the direction north. I can imagine that you would find yourself in a situation where you're lost in the woods by yourself. I hope that doesn't occur to you. Uh, if you are in the woods, you might be thinking, well, I have my smart device, that I'll have a compass on it, you can just tell me. Or you can tell by the sun how it sets in the west, rises in the east. But uh, the reason I like to point this out with you of how the Big Dipper finds north is it has a very poignant... Um, um, place in our history in the United States, and that'll come up momentarily here. The two stars at the front of the cup, we often call them the pointer stars, are going to point the way to Polaris, the North Star. Polaris, interesting because the whole sky appears to rotate around it. Actually, it's the Earth that rotates, but the effect is the same. A lot of people think Polaris is the brightest star in the night sky. In fact, it doesn't even make the top 50. I don't even think it makes the top 100. The brightest star in the night sky, you may recall, is Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. And here is Polaris. You use the pointer stars to find your way to Polaris. And Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. Still have Polaris right up here. I find Polaris in this patch of sky. I want to find the Big Dipper. Big Dipper, Polaris right there. If you know where Polaris is, you can figure out which way is north. I know this isn't a skill that's going to be too handy in the modern society. But as I mentioned, there's a sobering historical reason why I like to share this with you. Imagine that this symbol here is the part of the sky directly over your head. And in fact, astronomy, you have a specific term for that you'll want to get in your notes. The point that is directly above your head is called zenith. The point directly above your head is zenith. So if you're sitting at a table, couch, chair, on the floor, and you look up at the ceiling, that point directly above you on the ceiling we would call zenith. So zenith, the point directly above your head. So back to the text here. Now trace a line from there to Polaris. Let's recall where Polaris is. Here's the Big Dipper. And then pointer stars to Polaris. So trace a line from there to Polaris. There being Zenith. Zenith to Polaris. Zenith to Polaris. This direction would be north. That way in through the page. So this line points towards north. 
And this is why I like to share this with you. During the American Civil War, this is how fugitive slaves found their escape to Canada. So at one point, your natural given rights as a human, you actually had to go out and seek if you were in slavery in the United States. And Canada did not uh, view humans as property, as this time in the United States did. And so certainly it would be a dream, a goal, ambition for slaves in the United States to want freedom, obviously. And so they wouldn't pack up all their belongings, which wouldn't be very many to begin with. But they would want to head towards north, where Canada, and they could be free and humans and as they should be. And so... They wouldn't pack lots of stuff. They wouldn't have written maps in case they were caught. They might be able to proclaim got lost or something. But there was this very strong oral tradition of reciting, passing to one another how to find north using the stars. And some of you might be familiar with this as it's this storybook you may have had read to you in grade school called Follow the Drinking Gourd. And it's a wonderful story sharing how many of the slaves found their way to Canada in remembering how to use the Big Dipper and such to find North. All right, we'll give it a try. The pressure certainly is not on you at this moment, as though your entire life of freedom depended on it. The way that we are going to find North is first find the Big Dipper. Yep, it's right there. Is it up, down, left, right? Up here is the Big Dipper. The next step is you want to use the Big Dipper to find Polaris. So we use these pointer stars. It's going to take you to Polaris, the North Star. Then this point, you recall, is Zenith. And then from Zenith to Polaris. Zenith to Polaris is the direction north. So this direction is north. Congratulations if you figured that out. Let's try this again. Big Dipper is, Big Dipper, Big Dipper, instead up on the right, this time it's up on the left, now which way is north? We take the Big Dipper and find Polaris. And then from Zenith to Polaris is north, so this top X here points the direction to north. All right, follow the sequence and figure out which way is north. So I'm going to find Big Dipper. Big Dipper, Big Dipper, right here. From the Big Dipper, you use the pointer stars to find your way up to Polaris. And then direction of zenith to Polaris, that way is north. So congratulations on the down. So follow to Polaris. Didn't draw that clearly on the previous slide. You made it this far successfully. You're a night navigator. Congratulations. I think you should put that on your resume. In fact, I did have one time I was reviewing Science Sterling Scholar applications and a student had taken astronomy and put on their application they were a night navigator. I thought that was fabulous. Incidentally, this M or W-shaped constellation is Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia, I've heard lots of different pronunciations. I usually say Cassiopeia. Is the queen of Ethiopia in Greek mythology. If you squint, it looks a little like a crown. Now, I always call it the M shape, whether it look as though it's a W in the night sky. You think about the rotation. The reason I always think of it as an MW, or excuse me, an M shape, is the reason that you have landed yourself as me, as your astronomy instructor. It has to do with my 10th birthday. And you may recall I grew up in the United Kingdom. I grew up on a military base, and on a U.S. military base, your 10th birthday is the highlight of your life because you could have your own military ID card, meaning you can enter the uh, stores on the base, the movie theater. You don't have to have your military sponsor right there with you that let you in. You can actually walk in first with your 
military sponsor not too far behind. But it was a big deal to get your military ID card. And we would ask the sergeant who was uh, laminating our ID cards to punch a hole in it. And they'd put it on his dog, ting, dog uh, tag chain for us. And we would wear that all the time. So our elementary teachers always knew who the 9-year-olds were in the class and who the 10-year-olds were in their class. As us 10-year-olds always had the ID card around their neck. So the tradition was get your ID card and then you would go off to McDonald's for your birthday celebration. And this was at a time when there was only one McDonald's, I think, in the United Kingdom, and that was London. And it was actually two-story, and the birthday parties were fabulous. And uh, my parents asked me, what would you like to do for your 10th birthday? They're completely expecting me to say, oh, I'm going to get my ID card and head to McDonald's. Well... I came out with, of course, I'd like to have a military ID part, but then I would like to go to the London Planetarium for my birthday. And this is the star dome here that's a very distinguishing feature of planetariums. If you haven't been to a planetarium, one closest to us would be the Clark Planetarium in its Hanson Star Theater dome in Salt Lake City in the Gateway. And star theaters are awesome because the presentation is projected on this dome. So you have seats that will tilt pretty far back for you. And you can enjoy a very close-up view here of the solar system. This is likely a look of Saturn through the uh, Cassini mission data and imagery. Well, I have never asked my parents because I really don't want to know how they managed to get 10 or fellow 10-year-olds to go to London and enjoy a star show and a trip around the museum. They probably paid them, but I don't want to know that. So uh, at the end of the star presentation, the narrator mentions how over time, your star patterns are going to change their appearance. They're not always going to look like the Big Dipper or Cassiopeia. For example, if you were to... Oh, this is the uh, Clark Planetarium mentioned for you in Salt Lake City. Hopefully several of you have been there. But the uh, narrator mentioned how stars will change over time. This is Orion, and after about 100,000, 125,000 years, it's going to look more like that than today's appearance. Another example here is Leo the Lion, and over 100,000 years, it's going to change its appearance. So the narrator is mentioning how these stars are going to change their appearance over time and tells us look into the northwestern hemisphere and you'll see how some star patterns may look differently. And so we cast our eyes, we look up there, and the planetarium had spelled out happy birthday and my name up on the dome. And if I wasn't hooked on astronomy before, which I was, that just absolutely sealed the deal and been able to enjoy sharing my passion of the night sky and astronomy with students for many years now. And the computer has put you in this class, and I am ended up in this class thanks to the London Planetarium locking my name in stars up in the Planetarium Dome. Big Dipper, as it appears today, 100,000 years ago looked more like this. Maybe it wouldn't be called the Big Dipper, maybe the Big Spade or the Big Shovel. 100,000 years from now, so into the future, a lot of students in northern Utah have always uh, quipped that this would be the great snow shovel. And here's just a look. 100,000 years ago, today, and then 100,000 years in the future. And then more detailed over time. And the reason for the strange poles or tugs in different directions is because of what the star, individual star, is gravitationally attracted to in its neighborhood. So this star at the end is being pulled this way, whereas the majority of the stars are being pulled in a near opposite direction. So I always call Cassiopeia an M because it's one of the M's in my name that was spelled out on the London Planetarium Dome when I was 10. Of course, admittedly, you have to squint to think of it as a crown. Most of the time I see the story goes that this is the throne 
and this is where your shoulder blades of your backside would rest against the throne. Your bum backside would sit on the cushion here, and your feet are resting on the floor here. Cassiopeia was a very beautiful queen. She was well aware that she was beautiful, so she had quite the streak of vanity and conceit about her, so she would make sure everyone knew that she was beautiful. The gods placed her in the sky to honor her beauty, but also to punish her for her vanity. As six months of the year, if you remember the stars rotate throughout the evening and throughout the year, so for six months of the year she's upright in her chair, probably the W shape pattern, and then for the other six months her ankle is chained to her throne, and so she falls out of her chair, her throne, and looks very, very, very disgruntled. So punishment for being too vain in her earthly existence. And to top it off, she is across from her daughter in the night sky. Andromeda is across from Cassiopeia in the night sky. Cassiopeia, always on the side of Polaris to the Big Dipper, the opposite the handle part, not the cup part. So Polaris would be here, the Big Dipper orienting itself here in this image. So pointer stars to Polaris, and then just on the other side of this jump is Cassiopeia. I'll we'll give you an opportunity to see if you can find Cassiopeia in this slide. Lots and lots of stars. Do we start by finding Big Dipper? Big Dipper is right, whoops, Big Dipper is right here. And then this points the way to Polaris. And just on the other side, as you saw there, is Cassiopeia. Find the Big Dipper. Remember that not all stars in a star pattern are visible in the evening. We've got Orion down here. That's Betelgeuse, Taurus, Pleiades. Ah, there's Big Dipper and a little bit of the handle cut off there on the page. Where's Cassiopeia? Big Dipper was up here. So this points the way to Polaris. And then just hop, skip, and a jump. There's Cassiopeia right there. A little recap. Oh, I did the spoiler for you. Orion is there. Betelgeuse. Voila. Uh, Betelgeuse is Arabic for armpit of Orion. I was uh, teaching this course to some teachers, and one was a native Arabic speaker, and he pointed out it really means more of shoulder area. The club on Orion's right arm, if he's facing us. Sometimes near the top you'll see what looks like a really bright star. And it's actually not a star, it's a planet. Could be Venus or Jupiter. Many times people ask me, did you see that really bright object in the sky this morning or in the evening? They'll ask me, what's the name of that star? And I have to disappoint them and let them know it's not really a star, but it's the planet, typically Venus, that uh, people come and ask me about. But Venus has gotten the nickname of the morning star and the evening star because it is so commonly mistaken as a star, and it is so bright. And that is something you'd want to have in your notes that Venus is often nicknamed morning star or evening star, depending obviously on when you're seeing this very bright star looking object that is in fact a planet. All the planets in our solar system move around a flat disk. You know that as the ecliptic. That makes them easy to find if you know where Orion is. They move along that line. And uh, we actually covered that before now. The final to sequence, finale to sequence one, if you're unsure about anything so far, you may want to go back and review. When you're ready, start by finding Orion. Right there. Now the Big Dipper. Up top there, 
I bet you know the asking about where Polaris or Finding North is. Oh, Cassiopeia. Right there. As Big Dipper being here, Polaris, and then on the other side, Polaris is Cassiopeia. Let's see if we can find a planet, which in this situation happens to be Venus. Here's just showing you how bright this evening star is. The moon here, big source of light pollution here. But Venus just pops out. And I didn't circle it for you here, but Venus is right there. There's the planet Venus. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish I wish tonight. That's how a star is Venus. Planet light, planet bright. Ah, there's Venus. The ancient Maya were obsessed with Venus. They built their calendar around its 584-day year. So if some of us think that the year is a long time, imagine being on planet Venus. Here's a look at days, not years, but days around the solar system. So if Earth Day is about 24 hours, compared to the time it takes other planets to rotate once about its axis would be the day. Leave that up a bit here for you to look at. The planet that has a day most similar closest to us is Mars. So if you want just a little bit more time in your day, off you go to Mars. I'm glad they finally opened a 7-Eleven here on Mars, but it's annoying how it closes for 37 minutes every day. All right, 39, 37, give or take. Now find Polaris. Polaris, we know, is also the North Star. Way to find North Star is find Big Dipper, throw Orion, Pleiades, Taurus. Here's the Big Dipper, so it points the way to Polaris right there. So which of these crosses is to the north? You are correct if you follow the outline of the, well, we can leave it there. The outline of the Big Dipper to the wonderful Polaris, and then from Zenith, remember the point directly above your head, it's called Zenith. Zenith to Polaris, that is the direction north. All right, last little check-in of finding Betelgeuse. Voila. Congratulations! You have now graduated from Night Navigator to a full-fledged stargazer. It would be patchworthy or something if I had that in the budget. But your new skills will fade unless you try them out in the real sky within a week. And that is so very, very true. As with learning language, you have to practice it, use it pretty frequently in order to retain that skill. If they do fade, just run through the sequence again.